From fast moving white water to calm pools, rivers and lakes play a vital role in the Earth's water cycle. The water that evaporates from ocean falls as rain or snow. Some of the water soaks deep into the ground and plants take up some quantity or they evaporate again. A large quantity of this water finds its way into rivers, flowing downhill until it reaches the lowest level, which is usually the sea and sometimes an inland lake. Across the world, this sequence of event is called the water cycle. In addition to this chain of water cycles, rivers and lakes also help in shaping the landscape of planet Earth. As the river flows, it wears away the ground and slowly and steadily over millions of years reshape the landscape, forming one of the most diverse biomes. Many great rivers start their journey in mountains and highlands like the Yangtze in China that flows from Tibetan plateau and the Ganges in India flowing from the Himalayas. Traveling through the mountains, these rivers create their own path and are capable of reaching any kind of landscape from arctic tundra to hot desert. Rivers flowing through rainforest regions are fed by plentiful tropical rain forming vast waterways several kilometers wide like the Amazon and Congo rivers. The Mississippi River and its tributaries form the largest river system in North America. Some rivers flow by the side of a snow-capped mountain in a very small area, while others collect water from a vast area of land. Sometimes the river drains an area and is called its watershed. A large watershed may contain dozens of small rivers and streams or tributaries flowing into the main river. These rivers and streams combine together to make up a river system. The Amazon River system has the biggest watershed of all and covers about one-third of South America. The Mississippi River system is nearly as big but this system carries only about one-tenth as much water as the Amazon because far less rain falls there than in South America. Rivers across the world vary in many ways. While some rivers like Rhine in Europe flow evenly throughout the year, other rivers experience annual floods during the rainy season. They also vary in amount of mud and sand particles or sediment that they carry. The Mississippi and the Amazon are very muddy rivers and the fish living in these rivers find their way using smell and touch instead of sight. High mountains are worn down by the rivers as they carry away the crumbling material forming valleys. This wearing down is called degradation. New mountains take shape as old ones wear away, forming a cycle that continues over the years. Sometimes it so happens that the river keep cutting down into its valley while the land around it keeps rising. This deposition of weird away particles is called aggradation and the most spectacular result of this process is the Grand Canyon in Arizona. The rushing water of rivers and streams provide different kinds of habitats for animals and plants. In addition to this, 
The way the water flows has a huge influence on the kinds of creatures that can survive in it. Like the swift flowing streams capture plenty of oxygen from the air, helping fish and other aquatic animals breathe underwater. But food in such streams can be scarce as there is no mud for the plants to take root. So the biggest source of food in the stream is not plants, but waste material from outside the stream. When a stream runs through a forest, dead leaves and rotting wood fall into the water forming the initial community of living things like the fungi and bacteria. These microorganisms break down the dead material, forming slime around rocks and leaves in streams. These then become the main food source for aquatic larvae of insects, which in turn become a meal of the predators such as water beetles, water bugs and fish. As the river reaches lower ground, the flow of water becomes smoother. Here, even though the river flows faster, but near the river bed, the water is calmer, allowing the sand and mud to settle. Worms and mussels bury themselves in the bed and filter mud and water for small food particles. It is also a place for the water weeds to take root trailing their long stems in water. Tall plants like reeds too grow around the water's edge. Some huge rivers fall from great heights, resulting in thundering waterfalls, creating their own mini-environment and filling the air constantly with the mist and spray. The Amazon River floods a huge area of forest every year and the trees have learned to survive being flooded for months at a time. Many fish use this time to swim in here and feed and reproduce. Some trees drop their fruits during the flood and depend on fish to eat and distribute the seeds for pollination. The journey of river ends as the river reaches the sea. If the river brings enough mud and there is no powerful sea current to take it away, it may build its own flatland called a delta far out into the sea. In contrast to the rivers, a lake forms when water collects in the depression caused in the land. Lakes are relatively young features on Earth's surface and glaciers created them during the Ice Age. Glaciers are slow-flowing rivers of ice that create great hollows out of the land as they move. While America's Great Lakes formed in this manner, some of the world's oldest and deepest lakes have a different origin. Like in East Africa, movements in the Earth's crust created vast spills in the land that filled with water and formed deep lakes, some now million years old. A lake can also form in a valley blocked by a landslide. While most of the lakes are freshwater, some lakes are salty. These lakes are sometimes much saltier than sea. Caspian Sea is the world's largest salt lake and was once joined to the ocean. Interestingly, most salt lakes lie far away from the sea. These lakes are salty because rivers that drain into lakes always carry dissolved salts. For a lake to remain fresh, it has to have an outlet to allow the salt to wash away. If the lakes do not have an outlet, the salt flowing in builds up and makes the lake salty. These salty lakes support only selected unusual creatures. However, lakes never remain lakes forever. Even largest of lakes 
fill up slowly with sediment and disappear. While most of the lakes are 12,000 years old, the oldest lake is Lake Baikal in Siberia, which is 25 million years old. Lakes depend more on food produced in the water itself than on dead material falling in from the shore and the way the waters of a lake mix or don't mix greatly affects the lake's life. While the top layer is very low in nutrients, the lower layer has it in abundance. And why is it so? The surface water warms up as sun rays fall on it, making it less dense than cold water. As a result, it floats on top as a separate layer. The waves of this top layer mix with the air and absorb plenty of oxygen making it ideal for animals to survive. But as the family of the animals increase, the nutrients are used up by them, diminishing the nutrients at the top layer. The lower layer, on the other hand, has less opportunity to receive oxygen and therefore is not capable of supporting life very much. When the animals living on the top die, they sink below the bottom layer making it rich in nutrients. The edges of the lake are shallow and receive sufficient sunlight for reeds and other plants to take root in the muddy bottom. These shallow areas are also ideal habitats for insects, snails and other creatures. The plants growing here provide hiding places for fish. There are also other lake shows where waves and winds do not allow plants to take root, making these rocky shores look barren. In rivers and lakes, water is rarely in short supply, so they provide home to many microscopic planktons, towering palm trees, plants and plant-like organisms. But getting enough light, air, and nutrients poses a great challenge for these surviving plants. Compared to the land plants, water plants face a totally different world. Just like us humans, they require oxygen, but growing in mud devoids them of this vital element. They make up for this with air-filled stems and leaf stalks. These transport oxygen down to their roots and often help stop the plants from sinking in the water. Another danger the plant face in stream is that of being washed away by the water current. But unlike land plants, they also have the advantage of getting enough water. They can take in water through their leaves and stems instead of completely relying on their roots. In case a pond dries out, some species of plants become land plants for a temporary period. Algae forms one of the most important plants in freshwater. They are not true plants, but just as plants, they also use the sun's energy to synthesize their own food through a chemical process called photosynthesis. Maximum of these freshwater algae are the microscopic single-celled variety. These play a crucial role in the community of tiny free-floating organisms called the plankton. These planktons form the basis of food chains in both the sea and freshwater. Other types of algae grow attached to rocks or surface of larger plants where they are sometimes visible as a fuzzy green layer. A variety of phytoplankton is found in freshwater. Cyanobacteria are the smallest ones that multiply until they form a thick green scum on the water. These cyanobacteria were once called blue-green algae, but they are neither true plants nor true algae. They are considered to be types of bacteria, but different from the ones that cause human diseases. Diatoms are other microscopic algae 
known for making beautiful glass like shells out of silica, the same substance that sand is made of. Other than these small and simple freshwater plants, large flowering plants form a majority of freshwater plants. These flowering plants have dominated plant life on Earth since they first evolved more than 100 million years ago. Mountain streams, non-flowering species such as moses and ferns can also be common. Freshwater plants have their origin in land living families of plants and are easily described in terms of the way they grow. Like the reeds that grow through shallow water and into the air are called emergence. As the water gets deep, these plants are replaced by water lilies. These have floating leaves and roots and are firmly anchored in the bed. Other kinds of plants freely float on the surface of the water with their roots dangling in water while some live entirely underwater. Some plants have even adapted to survive in fast streams. They do this either by clinging tightly to the rocks or growing long, flexible stems. These stems sway in the water current without getting carried away in the stream. Reeds, cattails and other emergents can form dense stands along the edge of a river or lake. Spreading quickly, they send horizontal stems called rhizomes through the mud. In due time, the stems produce new shoots which appear as parts above water. On the edge of a pond, the dead remains of emergent plants can build up to form a waterlogged soil called peat. Peat is very fibrous and microorganisms can't break it due to lack of oxygen. It builds along the pond edges. The pond may gradually fill up. In time, trees and shrubs may take over, forming a swamp or even dry land. Water lilies also grow using rhizomes. The rhizomes store food and are eaten by people in some parts of the world. Biggest species, the giant Victoria lily of the Amazon, has round, tray-shaped leaves up to 2 meters or 6 feet wide. The upper surface of the leaves have tiny air holes through which water lilies breathe. The leaves also produce wax, preventing them from filling with water. Water crowfoots, duckweeds and poundweeds also have floating leaves and are important food for ducks. Like water lily, the sacred lotus of Asia is a water plant with a large emergent leaves and flowers. In Buddhism, it is regarded as a sacred flower. Another lotus flower native to North America is regarded as subspecies of this sacred lotus, while many consider it as a separate species. The most specialized water plants are those that live completely submerged. They often grow in shady places and must absorb all their oxygen and other gases from the water. These finely divided leaves of submerged plants help them absorb gases and nutrients. The most widespread plants are the milfoils and milfoil is derived from the name in French that stands for thousand leaves. Plants that eat animals are called carnivorous plants and bladderwort is the only carnivorous plant that lives underwater. It floats just below the surface in ponds and grows small swelling called bladders. 
If a mosquito larvae or a water flea bumps into a bladder, it is sucked in and trapped. The plant then digests it and fulfills its need of nutrients like nitrogen. There are other carnivorous plants that grow in bogs and fens. These carnivorous plants trap insects to get nutrients not present in the soil. The plants depend on insects and winds to transfer the pollen containing the male sex cells from one flower to another through a process called pollination. A seed is developed within the female part of the flower when that part is pollinated. Reeds and cattails are wind pollinated. The small flowers of these plants produce dusty pollen that can flow for miles in the wind. Plants like water lilies and other species with showy flowers rely on insects to pick up sticky pollen. They attract insects with scent, colorful petals and a sugary secretion called nectar. There are some water lilies that even generate heat as an attraction. Water plants are known as some of the worst weeds in the world. Today, these weeds have spread far beyond their original ranges and have invaded foreign countries thanks to us human beings who are responsible for this unintentionally. Some have been grown as ornamental plants in garden ponds which then escaped into the wild. Others have been sold as aquarium plants across the world. When people empty their aquariums into the lakes or ditches, the plants escape. When they reach their new habitats, there may not be any animals that are capable of eating these plants. This results in them multiplying beyond control. Once these foreign species have established themselves in new habitat, they are helped by bone trailers to spread to far off places by transporting it from lake to lake. A plant from South America is one of the notorious weeds of warmer climates. Known as water hyacinth, it has large glossy leaves and striking purplish flowers. It provides horizontal underwater stems, giving rise to new plants, thus multiplying asexually. In a small period of time, Water hyacinth can spread to cover a large area of water with a dense mat of plants, preventing oxygen from reaching the water and choking the native wildlife. Because of its intensity of influence, a whole scientific journal is devoted to this one plant and the problems it causes. These water weeds have spread to such a vast extent that they have given rise to a huge industry that deals only with destroying water weeds. Different lines of attack have been formulated to battle against these invading plants. This process is called biological control. Some of the techniques of biological control include mechanically removing plants from the water, poisoning them with plant-killing chemicals called herbicides, introducing organisms such as insects that eat plants or cause disease. People are also educated to be careful when they move boat trains. River Nile may be longer than Amazon, but the Amazon is Earth's greatest river and drains the largest river basin in the world. The sheer scale of the Amazon River is awe-inspiring. 
one-fifth of the entire world's river water passes between its banks. Rivers of the Amazon Basin are of three main kinds, namely white water, clear water and black water. The Amazon and its major southern tributary, the Madeira, falls under the category of white water rivers. White water rivers are actually light brown and have gained this color from the sediment that they carry down from the Andes mountains. It is very difficult to see in these murky waters and therefore fish that live in these rivers use sound, smell and touch to navigate through these muddy waters. Clear water rivers carry little sediment as they drain the much more ancient worn down rocks of Brazilian highlands. A diverse range of fish migrate in vast numbers up and down clear rivers such as the Xingu, Araguaia and Tapajus. Just like clear water rivers, black water rivers too carry little sediments but the dissolved substances from the decaying plants give the water a dark color. Black water river includes the Rio Negro, which meets the white water Amazon near Manaus. This black water tributary is the world's second largest river in terms of volume of water flow. Even small tributaries in the Amazon river system are major rivers. They provide a system of watery highways useful for travel in a region with a few roads and the strength of the Amazon current is so strong that it carries its waters up to 320 kilometers out into the sea. The Amazon is unique in its own way and provides some unusual habitats. Plants float on the river forming islands that may be over one kilometer long and during the dry season they sink and decay. It has far more types of fish than any other river system. Between 2000 to 3000 different species live within the sea. It will be interesting to know the animals that inhabit these fresh waters. The majority of them belong to the family of invaders. These are the kind of animals whose ancestors entered fresh water from either the ocean or from land to make fresh water their permanent home. All this and much more in the second part of Rivers and Lakes.